The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Jesus said to the eleven and those with them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Probably the most difficult part of the whole story of Jesus is this ascension business. The difficulty is that we just don't perceive our world in the same way as the biblical writers did then. And so it's, you know, when you can't get past the mechanics of Jesus being lifted up into the heavens, it's kind of easy to miss the meaning of what this whole ascension thing is really all about. Jesus' ministry did not end with a rocket launch, nor was it anything like, beam me up, Scotty. You see, ever since Copernicus convinced us that the Earth is not the center of the universe, up just doesn't mean up in the same way anymore. There was a time when it really wasn't that weird to think about Jesus perhaps looking down on us through the clouds, but that time is long gone. And that's where we are. But even so, we still have to deal with these scriptures when they speak to us about Jesus being lifted up or taken up into heaven. And what I would hope is that, you know, if you don't already, from now on, when you hear that kind of language, you understand that it means that your life has been taken up and lifted up into something far more grand than maybe you can possibly imagine, and it's happened because of Jesus. Jesus' ascension is kind of like Christmas in reverse. Christmas is all about God coming to our place, caught up in our human life. Jesus' ascension is all about us going to God's place. Now, in the Bible, heaven is God's place. That's where God lives, all by himself. And earth is our place, where we live. Jesus is lifted up into God's place into God's divine life once more. 
And the good news of ascension is that Jesus is taking you with him. But, fair warning, the distance between heaven and earth, between God's place and your place, is not measured in miles up or down. The distance between heaven and earth is measured by the amount of evil and destruction that separates you from God. Jesus' ascension is not about forces of gravity that need to be overcome, but rather his ascension is all about how the forces of sin and death and annihilation, that is, the distance between God and us, have already been overcome. It means that God's place wants to be right here with you right now. And that's Jesus' whole story. God is love, and God is always active in love. And when you review the whole thrust of the Bible, you get that. God speaks, and the world is created, and, and you are part of that too. You have been created also. God sends Jesus for the life of the world and raises Jesus from the dead to shout out and proclaim to everyone that the true source of divine life is self-offering. Jesus is raised from the dead. The distance between God and us is overcome. Your sins are forgiven. Your life with God is settled. Jesus ascends into the glorious coming of the kingdom of God, which is what he was here to preach anyway. And soon God will send Holy Spirit, whose work is to transform creation, to make a new you, a new us together. You have been taken up into this whole thing, lifted up in something far more grand than you can imagine. Because of Jesus, you've been taken up into God's place. But remember, taken up doesn't really mean up. I hope you're still with me. God's place is God's divine life, which is everywhere it needs to be. Jesus has ascended to that place, into God's kingdom, which is everywhere and is here too. But at the same time, not yet a reality, but yet still a work in progress. God's place is here. And yet, it's something for which we wait. And in our waiting times, which is like right now, Jesus is praying for us, interceding for you. Your prayers are being taken up to God now, and ours as well. Jesus is praying for your salvation. He's not praying for your resurrection. That's already a done deal. Are you getting the good news here? And what that means is that salvation, according to the Bible, is what Jesus is praying for. And according to the Bible most of the time, salvation is something that is right here and right now. Because in the Bible, to be saved by God is to find yourself safe after a moment of risk. To be saved by God is to be delivered from anguish. Read the Psalms. I flooded my couch with tears. How long, oh God, how long? And then, you know, all of a sudden my cup runneth over. The moment passes, you've been saved. To be saved is to have your economic disaster reversed. Check out the prophet Isaiah where people were wholesale taken off in, in, into uh, exile. All of their property gone and yet, you know, the hope that is there is one of salvation. That God will reverse that whole thing. To be saved is to have an entire people freed from slavery. Read Exodus. And, you know, it wasn't because all those people that were freed from slavery in Egypt were all pious. 
<laughs> they didn't even, you know, not all of them even trusted God, but salvation was something that took them past that moment of risk. To be saved by God is to trust God for your whole life's peace and shalom and safety and wholeness. How many times did Jesus say to people, your faith has made you well? Jesus is praying that it will be well with you. And that's what Jesus is spending his time with in God's place. So this is our witness on Ascension Day, that God has made his place with us so that we may find our place in God. It's not about geography, but it's about distances having been overcome it's simple, but of course, ri ridiculously mysterious, but so necessary for the world and so necessary for the people that God loves because Jesus' ascension calls us not to wait for heaven. That's been taken care of, but to work to fix things now here on earth because God's place is not up there but right here, too, where people need saving with food and shelter, with peace of mind and body, where people need saving because of worldviews that create distance between God's place and our place, where people would build walls rather than bridges, where people believe that destructive, threatening force makes life safer. Jesus' ascension means that God has made his place with us so that we might find our place in God. It's here and now, simple, yes, mysterious, certainly, but good news for all of us who still have our feet on the ground.